I'm wondering if, uh, have you thought about what is your gift and would you like to uh, share? I know it's kind of uncomfortable, maybe. But this is not a thing of pride because we didn't work for our gifts. We didn't earn our gifts. It's not by our talent or our ability. God gave them freely. So what gifts do you see in yourself or what gifts do you see in others? And let me pull up the, uh, the list of some of the things we saw um, the last couple of weeks in these chapters. And we're going to look at some more uh, tonight in Ephesians chapter 4. Or let me broaden out the question a little bit too and just say uh, what has struck you about these gifts that we have studied? Anything that you haven't considered before? Teresa. That's okay. I'll come to you next, Wes. Um, just as far as gifts, one thing like Dave, I really have admired his gifts of administration over the years. I mean, because I've known him decades and decades, and so I've seen the different roles that he's done in the church and at the camp, and, you know, he might have slowed down a little bit, but he knew how to get things done, and that, that was a gift of administration, I think, and being able to delegate and recruit people. Yeah, that's an important gift for the church, isn't it? To be able to get projects done that need to be done and organize and schedule and all of those things. Jim. Uh, one thing uh, that became obvious to me over my short time as a Christian and watching other people is sometimes you don't know if you have any of these gifts unless you try it. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Yeah, speaking of that, one of the gifts that's in both lists here, and we'll see it again tonight, is teaching. How do you know if you uh, may have the gift for teaching unless you try to teach at some point? Um, you know, you may have an idea whether or not you do, but one thing I appreciate, appreciate about our elders here is they, they take the role of teaching very seriously, and they make sure that they are protective of the teaching that we're giving, and yet they'll give people opportunities that think, oh, this may be my gift, and, and how do you know unless you have the opportunity to, to teach? So uh, I think that's a good balance that the elders have struck, that they're very careful about sound doctrine and the teaching, they're very cautious about that, but for those that may have that gift, I want to give them the opportunity to do that. Wes. Uh, going back and forth between the two congregations, I'm not here very much anymore, but up there the con congregation has been blessed with a good preacher, uh, a good teacher. The others have come to be, uh, to serve for the church there, but they couldn't handle the weather and this guy's raised in Michigan. He wants to be there. So this is one of the, the original preacher was the same way, but that was years ago. So now this guy's taken up the, uh, the banner and he's really doing a great job. So he's got terrific talents. And, um, and I was going to mention too, I've seen that in you too. Uh, well, thank you. I really appreciate your effort. And Russ. He's been my mentor all these years, and uh, tremendous um, talent. He keeps it buried pretty good, but he, he's very yeah. talented. Yeah, he uh, is. Amen to that. Yeah. yeah. But, and the elders of this congregation are spiritual men. They're chosen by the congregation to serve here, but also... I think God has placed them here. Amen. Definitely. They're spiritual men, and, and they want the best for us. They want the best for um, our service to the Lord. So we're surrounded by talent. And me, myself, I've discovered, well, I knew, I've known this for some time, but I, I, I'm able to put it to use in this nursing home 
even more when I'm with my wife. Um, the idea of being able to talk to people and just let them talk and also show the, show the attitude that I've gained from the Lord to them. Uh, it's hard to teach. You can't teach these people really because the, the most of them are, are um, hindered some way mentally. But uh, I can really shine um, and be an encouragement to them. And so, I love that. Yeah. yeah. That's a gift of encouragement or showing mercy, you know, uh, yeah. just, you know, being there to listen to people and help build them up. I've been able to offer prayers for some of them, families where a person has died that was staying there and having prayers with them. And it's, it's really been appreciated. And, but I, I think that's a, one of my talents to others. Yeah, amen to that. Yeah. Bill. I just wanted to get this away from my father-in-law. Um, no, I, it's easier really uh, to say uh, what spiritual gifts are to those who are close to you, uh, easier than we can uh, of ourselves sometimes. And my, I just have to lift up my wife here because she has this incredible ability to listen, and especially with, with female uh, she has a lot of lady friends uh, and some who, who can't get out or they don't know who else to call or, or maybe they're just not really outgoing or they don't have social skills or whatever. She will listen to them. Yeah. And I know because, because there's this circle of women in this congregation that is, blows me away. Um, we have so many women. I don't want to start naming them because I'm going to leave somebody out because there's so many that they, they work together and they take care of needs and they think of things and they plan good things. Yeah. And, they, and they're good listeners too. And many times it's the same person that they're ministering to. So some of these, some of these uh, ladies who need this attention get it from multiple ladies in this congregation and it <clears throat> it's inspiring almost makes you cry uh, when i sit in my living room and i hear my wife uh you know talking and, and then they start developing a, a trust not only my wife and some of the other ladies congregation just in the congregation itself they just feel apart and they're not even here right and that's something that we just needs to be said and yeah. it needs to be just need to yeah. be so thankful for that yeah, aren't we thankful I hope we for, never for all doing of our that. ladies? Yeah. yeah, the service that they do, the encouragement that they bring, just yes. so critical it, to the life it, of the church. Yes, and it keeps on getting better. We have fresh blood, new members in this congregation that um, feel, um, I don't know what it is, just seems like God's spirit is alive, and, uh, and we just really need to thank him for it. Yeah. Amen. 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 Well said. Other comments? So all of these gifts that we've seen are equally important. Uh, you may be exercising a gift and no one knows about it. It's behind the scenes, but the Lord knows. And it's important to the Lord. And uh, I just hope that we'll all be striving to, to find our gifts and to exercise our gifts. We'll see again tonight in Ephesians 4 how, how very important that is, that each of us are doing that. And under the, under the guidance of the elders, and I would like to second what was said, that our elders are, that they want to encourage you, I know, to use your gifts, and they want to encourage you to be a part and to be involved, and uh, they just provide wonderful oversight for us. Let's turn over to Ephesians 4. There are really, uh, in my mind, four passages that we could look to about gifts of the Spirit, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, and then if we have time tonight, we'll get into uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. Let's go to Ephesians 4 tonight, <clears throat> and we'll begin in verse 7. In, in the verses 1 through 6, um, 
Paul was stressing unity, the unity of the Spirit. Be diligent, he says in verse 3, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were also called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all who is one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. In all of that unity, one God, one Spirit, one baptism, uh, preserve this unity, he, he's imploring the people. Preserve the unity of the Spirit. In all of this unity, though, there is, again, the idea of diversity within that unity because we all have different gifts that we exercise for the good of the body. And so he says in verse 7, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Grace was given to us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And what he'll go on to say is that when Christ ascended back into heaven, he gave gifts to men. He gave gifts to the church. And it's grace. These gifts are a gracious gift. Of, of Christ, or we could say they're a gracious gift of the Spirit. It's really saying the same thing, isn't it? Uh, that Christ went back to the Father that He could give the Spirit so that He could fill the church. And so uh, that, that's the context in which He says this in verse 7. Grace was given. It's not something you've earned. It's not your, your intellect. It's not your power. It's a gift that God has given, Christ has given Look at verse 8. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself he who also ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. There's a lot to struggle with in this passage, and we'll probably do that on Sunday morning coming up in a few weeks in our Ephesians study. What does all this mean? He ascended and he descended and he gave gifts to men. I just want to clue in on sort of the main idea here. Look at verse 10. Why did he ascend and give gifts to men? According to verse 10. He might fill all things. What do you think that means? He might fill all things. We saw similar language to that back in Ephesians 1. Well, on Sunday morning we did. Ephesians 1, 22. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. So Christ, as the head of the church, he's filling the body. How does he do that? He, he gives gifts. And what are some of the gifts that he gives? Well, look at verse 11. What are some of the gifts? What's the first one you see? I hear some rumblings. Apostles. Apostles, yeah. He gave some as apostles. This was a gift that God gave to the church. The gift that some would exercise this, this role of an apostle. Um, do we have apostles today, and how do you know? Apostle, just first of all, apostle just means messenger or envoy, but there was the office of apostle, right? The twelve. Yeah, sent by Jesus, handpicked by Jesus, a witness to Jesus and his ministry, starting with the baptism of John. This is in Acts 1, verses 21 and 22. Had to be with Jesus from his baptism and had to be a witness of his resurrection. This was when they were replacing Judas. And I uh, don't know anybody that fits that bill today. A very special role. But he gave apostles to, to the church to fill the church. And here we are still... Um, benefiting 
and learning and growing from the teaching of the apostles that they laid down in the Scripture. He gave some as apostles. He gave some as prophets. I won't belabor the point, but we've talked about what's the difference between a prophet and a teacher. Similar in some ways, but the prophet had this direct revelation from God. We don't have that today. Uh, the, the faith was once for all handed down to the saints. And so if somebody comes and says, I've got this new message from God because I'm a prophet, that should be some alarm bells going off, right? Because the, the faith was once for all handed down to the saints. But uh, <clears throat> look at the next word in verse 11. He gave some as evangelists. This is just a proclaimer of the gospel. Um, a lot of times um, people will, when they talk about an evangelist, they'll say an evangelist is someone who uh, preaches the gospel to the lost outside of the church. It's not someone that outside preaches the inside the church. <laughs> yeah. yeah, to the lost. Yeah. And uh, I don't think that's quite right. I think an evangelist, when you look at the term in the Bible, it's someone that did reach out to the lost, obviously, but also to build up the church, as we see here. Paul told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist in 2 Timothy 4. In that, in that context, the evangelist was uh, preaching the word to the people of God, to the church. And so they're a proclaimer of the gospel. Does the church need the gospel to be proclaimed still to us? Yeah. Definitely. Uh, so uh, this is a gift that God gave some to do the work of an evangelist. Well, for what reason? For the, for the building up, for the filling of the church. Next you have what in verse 11? Pastors, right? What is a pastor? You know what I'm fishing for here, don't you? <laughs> what is a pastor? Is a pastor a preacher? Well, it could be. <laughs> not a deacon, no. Not a deacon. It's a common term today. Anybody in charge of the, of the events of the church, they call him a pastor. But right. In the, in the first century, it was a pastor was an elder or a shepherd. Right. Uh, pastor is an elder. That's right. right. A shepherd of the church. That's what the word pastor means, a shepherd. Um, and you could look at like First Peter 5 where the, the term elder or overseer and shepherd, they're all used together. Uh, it would be nice if they would use uh, Bible description for, uh, for a job or whatever it is, but we seem to stray from that. We like our own terms. It's always yeah, it's, it's good to use Bible terms, isn't yeah. it? Uh, sometimes people will call me a pastor, and I'm sure, Russ, you've had that, and Charles, Pastor Holden, Pastor Young, and uh, that's not, well, Charles is a pastor now he's because he's an elder, um, and I don't correct people. You know, we could get to that later is my idea that yeah. if people call me a pastor. It's not like a great insult or anything, but it's not, it's not biblically correct. I'm not a pastor. Right, pick your battles. I'm an evangelist or a teacher, but I'm not a, I'm not a pastor. So uh, this, is, this is talking about the role of elders, or we could call them shepherds, or we could call them overseers. Peter said in 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. He says, shepherd the flock of God among you, <clears throat> exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God. So here we have you as an elder, he says, shepherd the flock, pastor the flock. The pastor is an elder. And what an important role the pastors have in the church. And all of the gifts that we have and we exercise for the, for the glory of God, it's under the oversight of our shepherds. And, and who, who oversees the shepherds, the elders? The Lord. the Lord, yeah, the chief shepherd, Christ. 
<clears throat> and that's the biblical model. Our, our shepherds, they don't answer to another body of shepherds, or bishops, or whatever you'd want to call them. They, they answer directly to the Lord as the chief shepherd. How important is the role of elder or pastor in the church? Extremely important. It's a gift that God gave. Uh, what's the next word in verse 11? Right. Church, if somebody misses out, uh, they're responsible for that. It's a great responsibility, really. Yeah. For all the souls of the church. Watching for our souls. Yeah. Right. I was great asked to do that. I was asked to do that once, but I didn't want that responsibility. It's a very uh, weighty thing, isn't yeah. it? Yes. The next word is teachers. Uh, some see this. Uh, uh, as sort of a combined role, like pastor, teachers, teaching elders, but I don't know that that's really necessary. Maybe you could weigh in on that, Russ, but understand the reasons why people want to kind of put this together. But I think if you look at 1 Corinthians 12, the elders and teachers are listed there separately. And here, uh, for reasons about the Greek language, some people want to say this is teaching, teaching elders. There was a trend in Greek grammar because these two nouns are governed by one article to say that the pastor teachers is one group. But that sort of thinking has been reversed, and so I think we need to see them separately. All pastors are teachers, but not all teachers are pastors. Yeah, that's a good way to sum it up. All pastors are teachers. They need yeah. to be apt to teach, able to teach, but not all teachers are pastors or elders. But it is interesting to me that here teacher is listed, I think it's correct to say separately from these others, it really puts an importance on teacher, doesn't it? Uh, it's... As we talked a little bit about last week, um, it's not something you just want to you just want to come in and wing it, you know. As a teacher, it's it's a, a role that God has put you in, and it's akin to evangelist and pastor. I don't know if it's correct to call a teacher an office necessarily, but it's definitely a separate function and an important function in the church. And so we have to be very careful with our teaching. And uh, as I've already said, uh, we give people opportunities to, to teach, to see if it's something that they're gifted in, if it's something they want to pursue. And yet we have to be very careful about uh, that the teaching is sound and good and right that is coming out of the church. So it is a specific role, should be taken seriously, and again, uh, the evangelist and the teachers uh, exercise their gifts under the oversight of the pastors, the shepherds. Bob. You know, talking about the teachers, back in James chapter uh, 3, verse 1, it's very critical. It says, uh, not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is perfect and able to keep the whole body in check. The yeah. teachers are going to be held very accountable. Let not many of you become teachers. And we talked last week about not trying to shoehorn people into a certain role. You should be a teacher. Why aren't you teaching? It's not for everyone to take that role up. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a good point, Bob. <clears throat> that everyone here who's been baptized is part of and can be part of, and that is once you've been baptized, you're part of the priesthood. Everybody can show mercy. You can yep. lead in one way or another. You can give in one way or another. You can exhort in one way or another. In teaching, yeah, you have to be careful, but you can teach by example, and therefore it all falls in the line of service. Yep. And there isn't anybody here that can't do those things, maybe not publicly, but right. they can do those things. 
And we need to be exercising our gifts yeah, for the good of the body. Well, um, let's look at the next verse. There's a comment up here. Look at verse, uh, verse 12. Why did God give these roles in the church, according to verse 12? Right. That's right. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Um, how do these, the men in these roles, how do they equip the saints for the work of service? What's, what's the source of equipping? 2 Timothy 3.16 all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We've got to be bringing people the Word of God. That's what equips us. That's what equips the church uh, for the work of service. Right, because we're giving their teaching, right, yeah. that the apostles laid down. Yeah. And uh, nothing else has the power to do that. So we could get off track and teach and preach other things and talk about other things, but that's not equipping anybody. It's got to be through the Word of God. What about someone, by the way, someone who would say, <clears throat> I'm going to be a Christian, but kind of on my own terms, by myself, at home, like I, I like Christ, but I don't really like the church, and I'm just going to do my own thing. How does that fit into what we read here in Ephesians 4? Yeah, right. And how is the equipping going to happen? This is God's plan that he's laid out here. He's equipping through the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers today, and yet I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay home. It's not that important. I'm going to do my own thing. That's circumventing God's plan here for building up and equipping the church. Right. Right. The church is his body, right? So how can you say, give me Jesus, but not the church? Good thought. But he, the church is, was really, you could say it was formed so we could help build each other up. Right. Jesus didn't just say, okay, you're a Christian, but you're the only Christian in the world. He, he get, uh, the apostles gathered them together later and baptized a mess of them, and those Christians are the beginning of us. Right. And now we're taking advantage of all that history and flowing into the, the train. Getting on the train to heaven. Yeah. Mm. We need each other, don't we? There's a lot of things wrong with that kind of thinking. I'm going to do this all alone in isolation. One of the things wrong with that is here's God's plan for equipping and building up the church. Uh, look at verse uh, 12 again. <clears throat> he gave these gifts. He says, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. So as the saints are equipped for service, the saints begin to build one another up. I think this is a role for all of us, that we're building each other up. We're encouraging one another. Uh, we'll see that as we get down to verse 16 as well. Um, we need to be building one another up. But there has to be equipping from the Word of God. Uh, that comes through the evangelist pastors and teachers as they teach what the apostles laid down, the teaching, the doctrine that was handed down. And look at verse uh, 13. How long is this work of e equipping and building up, how long will it go on? Until when? We all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, 
to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That is a mouthful. To the measure of the stature of the fullness which belongs to Christ. I believe what he's saying there is we need to be mature, we need to be filled with the fullness of God. Well, what's the measuring stick for when we're mature and full? We, it's measuring up to the fullness of, of Christ, the measure of the stature of Christ. Well, when do you think that's going to happen, that we'll, that we'll grow and be this mature and this, this uh, complete in our faith? I don't think that's going to happen in this life, do you? Not fully, but we're working on it. We're progressing. We're moving that direction. And so I see this as saying to us that we need this equipping. We need this building up. We're always going to need it in the church. Right, yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah, and that's not to say that we don't also do things on our own in our own devotional time, our own studies, but to say, well, I don't need any of this. That's not God's plan. Bob. Well, it's like what this Bob said. You know, back in Psalms 133.1, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. Mm. It's not living by yourself. When brothers yeah. live together in unity, yeah. coming together. There's a pleasantness that comes from that. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Again? Yeah. Um, tell, tell the uh, Christians in the first century that it's not necessary to meet. They died to, to get together. They had to hide the fact that they were meeting in certain places. Yeah. And if they were caught, they'd been put to death. But yet they met together. They had this, they had this reason to get together to, to worship Jesus and to remember what Jesus has done for them. Uh, you couldn't tell them it's not necessary to meet. It's a great point. Risking their lives to meet together. And when they scattered, they still preached the message. That's right. It's yeah. like, what's does? Yeah. Good thought. Look at verse uh, 13 again. <clears throat> Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, what's the result of, of this equipping and building up? As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. God gave these gifts to build up the church so that we're not tossed to and fro and blown here and there by every kind of doctrine that comes along. We're supposed to grow up into Christ and, and to start to realize that there are these other doctrines out there and to not pay attention to them. Uh, not be taken in by the craftiness and the deceitfulness of false teaching. Look at verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Speaking the truth in love. That's how we're going to grow up into Christ. We need to be hearing the truth and speaking the truth and, and speaking it in love. Verse 16, from whom the whole body, talking about Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. How is the body going to build itself up, according to 16? What is required for that? Right. Every part has to be functioning. It's what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part. So as the saints are equipped by the teaching and they start to build one another up and the saints start to exercise their gifts, what's happening to the body? 
it's growing, it's becoming healthier, it's, it's more and more taking on the fullness of Christ himself. And this is how it's supposed to work. But it all starts with Christ and the gifts that he gave. So are we exercising our gifts? And uh, again, every one of you has one or more than one. And uh, God has put you in the body exactly where he wants you to exercise those gifts for his glory and for the good of the body. You might take a look <clears throat> at First Peter 4, 10 and 11. We don't have time to go there tonight. But here we see again the gift of service and also of speaking, so teaching, preaching, that kind of thing. Very interesting words there. The one who speaks is to speak as the one who's uh, giving the utterances of God himself because it's, it's going back to the Word. That's where we have to be. All right, we're out of time. I'm not sure how that happened, but couple minutes over. Thank you for your comments. We'll see you Sunday.